Just over 10 years ago, terror struck Britain. None of the bombers survived, but the menace they posed did not perish with them. This is a message to that despicable swine, David Cameron. Hundreds of young British men have left their own country to fight abroad. Some may return to take up arms here, they say in defence of religious belief. I spent much of my working life trying to understand how increasingly diverse societies like ours can cope with racial and religious differences. There's no shortage of difficult issues to tackle, but I think there's little doubt that it's the extremist adherents of one particular faith, Islam, who have created a major fault line in this country. Until now, experts, community leaders and politicians of all stripes have tried to reassure the public that extremist views are held only by a tiny minority of British Muslims. I believe we can win the struggle of our generation by standing up and promoting our shared British values, taking on extremism in all its forms, empowering those moderate and reforming voices who speak for the vast majority of Muslims that want to reclaim their religion. But is David Cameron right to say that most British Muslims share the same values as non-Muslims? And do they reject extremism and violent action in the same way as the whole of British society? In this film, the results of a unique new survey reveal how British Muslims themselves answer these questions. Our findings will shock many. For all of us, Muslim and non-Muslim, they pose profound questions about how we confront the looming threat to our very way of life. Twenty years ago, I commissioned the report which first introduced the term Islamophobia to Britain. Today, there's no shortage of evidence that we were right to be worried about hostility to Muslims, I've no doubt that much of it emanates from sheer blind prejudice. But not all of it. Police say that last November, the number of reported Islamophobic incidents in the capital tripled. It's easy to trace the cause, the Paris massacre and more recently the Brussels bombings by self-proclaimed Islamist fighters which left hundreds dead, including many Muslims. No responsible person would point the finger of blame at the whole Muslim community, yet those responsible for all these outrages were mostly born and bred in France, Belgium and Britain. Many of us have struggled to understand why young British men would commit such atrocities. So when Channel 4 asked me to examine the most comprehensive and detailed survey of British Muslim opinion, I jumped at the chance. First of all, I needed to know this really was as accurate a picture of the views of Britain's Muslims as science can deliver. The truth is that most non-Muslim Britons tend to meet Muslims only at work and in public, out shopping, for example. Hi, darling. How are you today? Brothers Sajid and Anis Karim have run this halal meat and veg shop in Tooting, South London, since 2004. We've got many customers, we've got Afro-Caribbean customers, all religions, all colours, all races. We know them by name, so it's a lot of banter, a lot of joking around. Under charge, yeah, 250 for you. Exactly 250 you give me, you want to take it from me, so you take it 250. Thank you, my dear. All right. Thank you so much. But this isn't exactly the kind of encounter where people share their innermost thoughts. So when a non-Muslim politician or journalist tells me that they know what Muslims are thinking, I do ask myself, how can you possibly be so sure? There are ways to dig deeper. So Channel 4 went to a leading analyst of public opinion, ICM. After the last general election, the opinion polls took a pasting. But many of them were done quickly, either by phone or online. The surest way to get it right is time-consuming and expensive, simply talking to people face-to-face. Face-to-face has traditionally been seen as kind of the gold standard methodological approach um, in the research industry over the years. 
sending interviewers into areas across the nation, uh, knocking on doors, finding the right people to produce a true representative sample of the target population. ICM decided that the best way to get a fully representative sample of Muslim opinion was to concentrate on areas where at least one-fifth of the population is Muslim. Smaller numbers just don't offer enough range to be representative. Once we'd achieved that, we booked our interviewers and we told them exactly how many Muslim men they needed to interview, Muslim women, Muslims uh, from different age groups, Muslims from different parts of the world, for example. The method, designed to achieve the greatest accuracy, meant the survey covered half of Britain's three million Muslims. Oh, good morning. I'm from ICM. While it couldn't be guaranteed to reflect the opinions of the other half in every respect, it would be unlikely to be far out of line. Finally, ICM had to make sure that they could compare what British Muslims thought with the rest of the population. We also did what we call a control sample, um, which actually was a nationally representative sample of all people across Great Britain. So we can immediately identify where views held by people from Muslim backgrounds differ from those amongst the community at large. ICM's researchers spent over a month interviewing 1,081 British Muslims face to face. So, firstly... One place ICM's researchers visited was Luton. The 2011 census records some 50,000 Muslims living here. The town has become associated with two very different faces of Britain's Muslim community. One is Nadia Hussain, the hugely popular winner of the Great British Bake Off. What could be more quintessentially British than the victory celebration of her traditional victorious sponge on a stretch of England's green and pleasant land? But just 15 minutes away from where Nadia grew up, here we are on the forecourt of Luton Station. And those are the gates through which four men passed to commit the worst atrocity on British soil in recent memory, the 7-7 seven, seven bombings. It is, of course, just a twist of fate that two of the most famous images of British Muslims are linked to Luton. What is important, however, is that they reflect two very different attitudes to their home country. The Channel 4 survey explored what Britain's three million Muslims really think on a range of issues. It also told us how they compare with what the rest of Britain is thinking. So here we have our survey results, which I've tried to illustrate at a top-line level using a chasm idea, because we do have a number of similarities between Muslims and the wider population, but in actual fact, once we look deeper into the survey results, we actually find that a chasm does develop between Muslims and the way they believe, the way they think, and the wider population. For example, we can see a number of things where the similarities occur. Most people think that they can practice their religion freely. Uh, most people believe that they belong to Britain, they've got an emotional attachment to it. Then we see the gap emerging in our chasm and we can find a number of things which are really striking. For example, when it comes to polygamy, one in three Muslims think it's acceptable to have more than one wife. Only one in ten members of the wider public agree. But then we get real, real substantive differences. Uh, when it comes to homosexuality, for example, only one in five Muslims thinks that homosexuality should be legal, but four in five members of the wider public think that that should be the case. And when it comes to sensitive matters around uh, political violence and indeed suicide bombing, well, four percent of Muslims would have some sympathy for both those things um, as against only 1% of the wider public. That could mean no more than a handful. And let's just put that into context for a second. 4% implies that just over 100,000 Muslims in the United Kingdom have some form of sympathy with violent acts. Britain's political elite, both left and right, have preferred to believe that only a very small number of Britain's Muslims sympathise with Islamist terrorism. The survey suggests otherwise. Empowering those moderate and reforming voices who speak for the vast majority of Muslims. The survey also suggests that everyone who's pinned their hopes on the rise of liberal and reforming British Muslim voices is in for a disappointment. 
those voices are nowhere near as influential or as numerous as they need to be to make an impact. And as we drill even further down into the detail of the survey, the prospects for integration do not look good. It's stand-up night at Leicester's Comedy Festival. Atif Nawaz is in full flow. I'm excited, Leicester. This is me. This is how it How are you excited? You guys on this side of the room, you have a word, OK? And your word is assalam. You guys on this side of the room, you also have a word. Your word is alaikum. One, two, three. Assalam. Congratulations, you've all just converted to Islam. <laughs> you can collect your complimentary Qurans outside. <laughs> My analysis of Channel 4's in-depth survey of British Muslim opinion begins with a figure that, on the surface, many will find encouraging. The great majority feel a sense of belonging to Britain and appreciate its freedoms. It's a privilege that we get to live in a country, in the UK, which lets us practice our belief. And I, I firmly take this as a privilege because we live in a country, you know, uh, the UK was traditionally a Christian country, wasn't it? And yet, you know, here we are, Muslim people, we're free, we can go to the mosque, we can pray, we can dress the way we want to, do all the things that we want to do. We've got halal food pretty much everywhere in the UK now. How wonderful is that? What a time to be alive! Perhaps a little more surprisingly, most British Muslims tend to trust in the fairness of the authorities. When it comes to using public services, Muslims believe that they would be treated in exactly the same way as any other member of the British public when it comes to things like encounters with the police, with the courts, using health services. There's a mainstream Muslim majority who have the same values, the same attitudes, the same behaviours as the wider British public at large. So far, so good. But underneath these surface attitudes, the trends are far less encouraging for those who believe in integration. How often, if at all, have you mixed socially with people from non-Muslims? 56% of British Muslims surveyed do mix with non-Muslims on a daily basis outside their home. But away from work or college, there's a very different picture. 21% said they go to the home of a non-Muslim just once a year or less. The same figure, 21%, never go to the home of a non-Muslim. At first sight, Anjum Anwar presents an unlikely figure in Blackburn's Anglican Cathedral. She's a devout Muslim, but for the past decade, she's been working with the cathedral to encourage interaction between Muslims and non-Muslims. 27% of the town's population are Asian Muslims. She admits that she's facing a huge challenge. There are certain areas which are wholly Asian and some would be wholly white areas. So if you have a child who goes to a school which is wholly Asian, who lives in an area which is predominantly Asian, where would that child meet children and people of other faiths? They're restricted, aren't they? So you have a child who goes to school from 9 o'clock till about 4 o'clock, then he will go to a mosque maybe, and then Monday to Friday he is within that area. You have weekends. Where is that child meeting? And I'm talking not just about Asian, but I'm also talking about a white child. Where do they actually meet? But besides the physical and social separation, or perhaps because of it, there's also a clear cultural gap between a significant section of Britain's Muslims and the wider population. Equality of women, social tolerance, freedom of expression are now all taken for granted as features of the British way of life. Happy Pride, everybody! Britain has embraced same-sex marriage. The centre ground of opinion in 21st century Britain is increasingly liberal. And some Muslims are fully signed up to that version of freedom. I don't like the idea of forcing anybody to do anything. It's got to be their choice. In Islam, you know, it's a fundamental thing that you're supposed to respect the rights of the country in which you live. So if you live in a country that permits homosexuality, that's got nothing to do with you. If somebody else is gay, you've got no right to talk about their life. But the Channel 4 survey found that significant numbers of British Muslims simply don't share this kind of tolerance.
This chart symbolises that in a block system way, where we can see the blue parts indicate the percentage of Muslims who believe uh, differently uh, across the top here compared to the general public at the bottom. Now, for each of the following statements, tell me to what extent you agree or disagree. Homosexuality should be legal in Britain. 52%, over half of Britain's Muslims, believe homosexuality should be illegal compared with just 10% of the wider public. Hamza Tortsis travels the country, promoting what he calls a compassionate and intelligent case for Islam. In his ideal world, there's no good place for homosexuality. Yes, I believe homosexuality is a sin. It's a spiritual aberration from a textual perspective. However, if I have a next-door neighbor and he happens to be homosexual, would I give him my milk? Of course I will. If he happened to have a heart attack and I found out, would I run in and give him CPR? Of course I will. Jewish people have too much power over the government. A significant number of British Muslims also hold attitudes towards Jews some distance away from those of the wider population. I'm going to come out and say there are, I'm sure, within the Muslim community, there is some anti-Semitism there, right? And I know that. In the survey, 35% of Muslims think that Jews have too much power in this country as against 9% of the wider public. Jewish people have too much power over the media. That kind of difference also shows up in other answers, such as Jewish influence in the media or global affairs. I suspect a lot of it is Muslims incorrectly uh, or erroneously uh, conflating what's happening in uh, Israel-Palestine with Jewish people who have nothing to do with Israel, Palestine or, or Zionism, right? I think this is the generation that's on its way out, right? Not the generation that's coming through that think about Judaism on par with Zionism, which are two different things. This is probably a forlorn hope. Whilst a slightly higher percentage than average of the over 65s holds these views, the survey shows this particular prejudice occurs consistently amongst all other adult Muslims. I'm now going to read out some statements about the way women are treated in Britain. Generational change might be expected to feature more strongly when it comes to the place of women in society. Of course, equal rights and status for men and women are now enshrined in British law. Yet 39%, two-fifths of British Muslims surveyed, say women should always obey their husbands, compared with only 5% of non-Muslim Britons. And once again, except for the over 65s, there's no particular difference between age groups. I was more than mildly perplexed, so to help me understand what the findings might mean, I brought together a diverse group of Muslim Britons. OK, so, you meet Guy, there, there's marriage in the offing, and he says, by the way, of course, the deal here is you have to obey me. Is that OK with you? If the husband is saying obey in the context of asking me to do things that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then by all means, because ultimately my faith teaches me that, um, and teaches many Muslims, that ultimately our duty is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, God. It is acceptable for a British Muslim to keep more than one wife. I strongly agree. In Islam, a man has the right to have up to four wives. In British law, polygamy is illegal. When it comes to polygamy, about one in three Muslims think that uh, that should be um, acceptable within British society, but hardly any members of the wider British public think along the same lines. The highest support for polygamy comes from the over 65s. But the youngest age group, the 18 to 24s, also share the general enthusiasm. 35% agree that it's acceptable for a British Muslim to keep more than one wife. In my experience, it's not the men that have demanded it, it's the women. I personally have met women who have said to me, I do not want a full-time husband. I don't want him under my feet. For a man, it's a huge responsibility. Yes. Mm -hmm. For a woman, it's a privilege. What I find also very um, hypocritical is how a man can have many mistresses, but then we find um, the members of the wider society criticising our way of life because we choose to say, you know what, if there isn't a polygamous marriage going on, each person is being catered for, each person is being, um, having their, their rights and their needs being met. These views about the place of women do not appeal to all Muslims. 
Ellen Manea is an associate professor of political science at Zurich University and herself a Muslim. She spent much of the past four years in Britain researching the treatment of Muslim wives. You see a certain kind of an attitude where the woman stands at the mercy of a husband who can basically tell her, if you don't behave um, in a way that, uh, that suits me, I will simply get another woman. If you get sick, I will get another woman. You know, if you can't have children, I'll get another woman. And by this fundamentalist interpretation of Islam, it's okay for a husband to beat his wife. She simply has to obey her husband, uh, fulfill his sexual needs even if she doesn't want to, and that means, accordingly, there is no such thing as rape within uh, marriage. It does appear that there's a Quranic justification for unequal treatment, and there's even advice for the aspirant polygamist. Secondly, you have to make sure that you are actually treating your wives in, in, in a fair way. And even Islam says that um, even within the Quran, if you have more than one wife, if you can't do justice to them, then don't have them at all. So you have to actually make sure that you are doing justice by them. There's a fundamental factor at work here. The clue is in the name, British Muslim. It's all about the religion. This is the church in North London where I was christened. I like to think that, even today, what I learnt here guides my attitudes and behaviours. However, even amongst us Methodists, the Bible doesn't provide a guide as to what to do every single minute of every day. Down the road at the Finsbury Park Mosque, attitudes are very different. For the believers here, the Quran provides teachings and guidance for Muslims to follow in all aspects of their lives. It's a kind of rule book for day-to-day -day living. We can't be a person of faith for a particular day or time. It's with us 24 hours a day. It's all within a certain framework. That's as may be, but what if that framework collides with the values of wider society? Nowhere is this more sharply contested than when it comes to freedom of expression. I know that you white people will use me for security purposes. Fuck you! Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park, London. It's the living embodiment of freedom of speech. This is the reality of life and free speech. Here, anyone can express pretty much any opinion they like, however offensive. Shut your stupid American mouth. No, no, no. <laughs> Most British Muslims think it's against holy law to show an image of the Prophet Muhammad. They're particularly offended by mockery of God's messenger. I firmly believe in freedom of expression and freedom of speech. People can say and do what they want to. But why? Why would you do something that is malicious? Why would you do something that would upset somebody? Now, if I don't like it, I'm not going to go and start a big protest or, you know, just start hating on them on social media. That's not what I'm going to do. I'm just going to ignore them. Atif's attitude is typical of the majority, but 18% of British Muslims, a sizable minority, do sympathise with the use of violence against those who mock the Prophet. And in your opinion, should any publication have the right to publish pictures that make fun of the Prophet? No. 78% of British Muslims say publications should not have the right to show pictures of the Prophet. 87% say there should be no right to make fun of the Prophet. If you study freedom of speech, you see freedom of speech had objectives. Its objectives were truth, accountability and justice. The minute you start to be vile and degrading, then you're going against the very objectives of freedom of speech. Liberal Muslims, like newspaper columnist Yasmin Alibi Brown, have become a somewhat beleaguered minority within a minority. She's come to expect routine opposition to her views, and worse. Well, increasingly, it comes from extremely intolerant Islam. The, the, the argument is always, you're not a Muslim. Don't call yourself a Muslim. You know, you, you will go to hell and then some really dangerous and horrible threats, really horrible threats, which sometimes I've had to get police protection for. So why are the views and values of many British Muslims still so out of line with the rest of society? 
Well, part of the answer probably lies in their ancestral backgrounds. Pakistan and Bangladesh account for the majority. Many are from Africa, some from the Middle East. The kinds of attitudes revealed by our survey might seem outlandish here, but in many of those countries, they are completely unremarkable. And ironically, it's the newest technology that's reinforcing the oldest ways. Cheap flights carry hundreds of thousands of Muslims to visit relatives every year, and the internet and satellite television bring the ancestral attitudes into British front rooms every day. Whether you sympathise or condemn people who take part in stoning those who commit adultery. This might explain one striking finding. Only two in three Muslims would completely condemn stoning being used against people who commit adultery in this country uh, compared to nearly all members of the general British public. It's clear that I and many others involved in the policy-making field just got the aspirations of British Muslims wrong. Our mistake was to imagine that because historically other minority communities, Hindus and Sikhs for example, had gradually moved to adopt some of the behaviours of the majority, that Muslims would follow the same pattern. But our survey suggests that significant numbers of British Muslims don't want to change and don't want to move to adopt the behaviours of the majority. In the next part, we reveal that many British Muslims would rather that non-Muslim Britain changed its ways to accommodate their way of life. Anjum Anwar's mission in Blackburn is to improve dialogue between the faiths. But she considers herself governed by the Sharia, the body of Islamic law that regulates Muslims' lives. What I eat is according to my Sharia, how I pray is according to my Sharia, how I dress according to my Sharia, how I treat the stranger and family members according to Sharia. I think people misunderstand the concept of Sharia law. Their only thinking is, uh-oh, once you got the Sharia, you'll be chopping heads off and hands off. That is not the case. We're not looking for that kind of uh, Sharia because we're not Islamic State here. As Anjum points out, Sharia can be understood in widely different ways. For Imran Haq, it's all about the politics. He's preparing to give his message to shoppers at London's Shepherd's Bush. The sort of Britain that we want is a Britain where, where the Sharia is implemented. The Sharia would entail um, Muslims and non-Muslims living together as they did from China all the way to Spain under the Ottoman Caliphate, the Abbas and the Umayyad Caliphate. It, it has happened in the past. The restoration of the Caliphate in the Middle East, by the way, is the key aim of ISIS. ISIS, ISIL, is still trying to establish a caliphate. Our survey of British Muslims shows that 7% support that aim. From what you can see on Instagram and Twitter, you can see that um, there are areas in Syria and Iraq where it looks like um, they are implementing Sharia. Imran Haq also wants Britain to become an Islamic caliphate. And what it would mean is that the Muslims living in the state, they would live uh, side by side with non-Muslims and the non-Muslims would pay something called a tax called the jizya, whereby their food, clothing and shelter and their honour will be protected and it will be provided for. You'll see that places like, you know, Downing Street and, you know, Buckingham Palace, they will be under the Sharia and we'll probably make it into a homeless person's shelter. Imral genuinely believes that the caliphate would be better for everyone, Muslim and non-Muslim. Unfortunately for him, hardly any British Muslims agree. 17% of British Muslims say that whilst wanting to integrate on some things, they prefer to lead a separate Islamic life as far as is possible. And 23%, almost one in four Muslims, support the idea of areas of Britain where Sharia law rules instead of British law. Our survey shows that a large minority, somewhere between one in six and one in four, does want to live in Britain under some kind of Sharia law. If that strength of view is reflected amongst the British Muslim population as a whole, that's around half a million people who want to live parallel, separate lives.
Justice in such areas would be administered by Sharia courts or councils. It's estimated that there are some 85 Sharia councils already operating across Britain. They act primarily to mediate in marital disputes. The very reason we have people coming to the Sharia Council is that there's a disagreement between the parties. While we often assure the women that nobody has a right to impose on you, neither do we nor do your husband. All we can do is to ask both parties, are you willing to have some sort of mediation between you two? Then we can make that happen. But if she refuses to do that, then it will not happen. As part of her research in Britain, Ellen Manea of Zurich University sat in on many Sharia Council hearings. What shocked me is that I saw a reading of Islam, an interpretation of Islam, that seems to parallel the most fundamentalist reading of Islam that you find in Taliban or you find in certain segments in Yemen, my home country. And I didn't expect to see that in the UK, in the middle of the UK. I didn't expect to see a segregated community, close communities, living by their own rules. And these rules, unfortunately, have grave consequences. And these consequences go directly to the rights of a, uh, of a woman. Women in these councils are being treated as minors in perpetual need for a guardianship, a male guardianship. You have rulings that tells you that if she decides to marry after a divorce, she will lose the custody of her children. You have a reading that in the end does not fit with the context that claim that we guarantee equal rights for everybody living in the UK. That's not what's happening in the UK. I'd now like you to imagine that you're preparing to send your children to school. The survey found another key area, education, where a large number of Muslims want to go their own way. 45% of British Muslims surveyed would prefer to send their child to a school with strong Muslim values. But allowing these separate values to dominate can backfire. That's what happened at Springfield School in Birmingham. Nashaba Hussein was its headmistress. The boys used to act as thought police. You know, they would go around and actually hit the girls on their heads if their heads weren't covered. I mean, I even had one boy, one nine-year-old boy, say to me, why haven't you covered your head? It's only slags who don't cover their head. That should not be accepted behaviour in state schools in Britain. Settling disputes in Sharia courts, sending children to Islamic schools, campaigning for a caliphate. Some people might argue that if these are the freedoms that Muslim Britons want, then that's what they should have. Many would say it's their own business. So, does it actually matter? After all, the phrase live and let live is probably the most commonly accepted expression of British tolerance, usually accompanied with a sort of, well, what can you do, shrug. But there is a problem with this live and let live, laissez-faire approach. Our survey revealed that the more people hankered after a separate life, the more sympathetic they were to violence and extremism. And that really does matter. If you thought that someone who's close to you was getting... When it came to exploring attitudes to violence, the survey asked British Muslims what actions they would take if they knew someone who was involved with supporting terrorism in Syria. Just one third, 34 per cent, said they would report it to the police. There may be several reasons for not shopping would-be jihadists. One, of course, is that you might be sympathetic to their cause. What British Muslims think about terrorists' acts was the most difficult issue the survey tackled. There is no right or wrong way of measuring sentiment on the use of violence, but we decided to use the word sympathy, expression of sympathy toward violent um, uh, questions or sensitivities uh, as the best way of dealing with it because it has been used uh, in similar surveys. When it came to the most sensitive questions about violence, ICM's interviewers handed over the questionnaire to respondents for them to fill in themselves 
and put in a blank envelope. The respondent might not want to give truthful answers to questions because they're uncomfortable, giving them what we call social desirability bias, where maybe they kind of give the answer that they feel is the right one to give rather than the one that they truly feel. We see 6% of Muslims think it's acceptable or have sympathy for making threats of terrorist action as part of the political process. And when it comes to the most extreme form of violence, suicide bombing, using explosives, for example, uh, to meet political objectives, well, about 4% of Muslims express some form of sympathy with the more extremist end of it. 4% of them actually uh, equates to just over 100,000 Muslims. ICM carried out one further piece of analysis for us. Is there any difference between the minority who sympathise with violent acts and the majority who don't? There are a number of factors which do emerge, which does give us a little bit of a handle on what might, they might be thinking. So, um, for example, a lack of social capital, not believing that you belong to Britain, not having that emotional attachment is, is one thing which uh, somewhat correlates with it. If, as a Muslim, you don't have a desire to integrate into orthodox British society, or indeed you want to uh, practice a more fundamentalist Islamic lifestyle, or even submit to Sharia law in this country, all of these things, all of these attitudes, to some extent explain why people might move down that path toward violence. The survey found that British Muslims who sympathise with violence are around twice as likely to prefer to live a more separate life here in Britain than those who don't. I think this is one of the most significant findings of this survey. Our live and let live culture may unwittingly have provided fertile ground for extremist thinking to flourish. There are many opinions swirling around as to why some Muslims would support violence against their own country. The Iraq war, dysfunctional households, fractured personalities, maybe. What we do know from the survey is that Muslims who have sympathy for violence are significantly more likely to hold illiberal views on issues like gay rights and women's equality than those who don't. So what the survey is showing us is the emergence of what you might describe as a nation within the nation, where many hold very different values and behaviours from the majority. I'd say that hardly anybody wants to see that happen. But the question is, what are we going to do about it? It's clear to me that we have to discourage the many Muslims who want to live a separate life according to values that are at odds with non-Muslim Britain. But that's not just a responsibility for government. To stand a chance of success, the whole of Britain may have to set aside the live and let live philosophy that's paved the way for separation and reassert the liberal values that have served our society so well for so long. Some think we may already be too late. You know, we're a dying breed. In 10 years, there will be very few of us left, unless something really important is done. Yet the Liberals shouldn't give up hope. Some young British Muslims have become more extreme, but others do hold views on some issues that look a bit more like the rest of Britain. Most noticeably, 28% of 18 to 24s said homosexuality should be legal, compared with just 2% of Muslims over 65. Increasingly, and this really interests me, I'm getting young Muslims writing to me who hate the lives they're living. They hate it. Some of them are gay. Some of them have been men and women have been forced into marriages. Some of them are lost because they feel no affinity to anything or anybody because they've never been allowed to. You know, it's just this thing about being a Muslim, as one of them said to me, I am a Muslim, but I'm so much more than that. There are Muslims here in the UK and there are a growing number who would effectively have no problem with LGBT, trans issues, etc. 
but who don't vocalize that publicly because there is also a vocal element within Muslim communities that says liberalism is not really Islam. We have to admit that. Those of us who are not Muslim shouldn't be telling those who are how to live their lives or how to meet the needs of their faith. And nobody likes the old idea of assimilation where people abandon their cultural identity in order to blend into some kind of mainstream. But that doesn't mean we do nothing. Many people, including me, believe that we can create a set of policies that promote integration, make clear that there are some things on which the society will not compromise, and which support liberal trends in all parts of society. We call it a policy of active integration. The Prime Minister has announced a number of measures to promote integration amongst British Muslims, like funding English lessons for Muslim women. There are also obligations that we should put on people who come to our country, and chief amongst them should be obligations to learn English, because then you can integrate, you can take advantage of the opportunities here, and you can help us to build the strong country that we want. Our survey suggests that David Cameron's on the right track, in spite of some criticism. But now, having heard what I've heard, it's hard not to conclude that, if anything, the Prime Minister's plans just don't go far enough. The evidence tells me that we need a much more muscular approach to integration. A top priority would be to stop the number of state schools segregated by ethnicity and religion from growing further. It's not an original proposal. So do we need to look at our educational system then? Are we saying that we should have a system where you have 50% Asian and 50% non-Asian? Because if you have just one monoculture, then sometimes if you're living in a monoculture as well as attending educational system, then it makes it difficult, doesn't it? I'm with Anjum Anwar. Prohibiting state schools from admitting more than 50% from any single ethnic minority would make a swift impact. Ofsted, behind me here, is the body responsible for inspecting schools and making sure they're well run. I used to work with them a lot when I was at the Equality Commissions. If anybody can make sure that schools are less segregated, then they can. But you can't make this kind of change happen just by issuing orders. What tends to work much more successfully these days is what people call the comply or explain approach to regulation. The comply or explain method has been used successfully in the financial sector. With schools, you'd first set a target mix with a 50% ceiling for any single ethnicity. Schools would have to comply, or they'd have to explain why they'd breached that ceiling. Finally, if schools consistently break the limit, then the regulator imposes special measures, like redrawing the catchment area to change the ethnic balance. This isn't just a theoretical plan. It's happened already with two schools in Oldham. One was almost entirely Asian, the other almost entirely white. They reflected the segregation in the town. The community of Oldham decided very bravely to, to come up with something innovative and to say, could they build some new schools where they would take people from both existing segregated communities. The Waterhead Academy was born, and in a deliberate act of integration, the two ethnically segregated schools merged and moved into a new building in 2012. The process was followed by social scientists from Oxford University, led by Professor Miles Houston. You can see that year on year, after the merger, you are increasing things that you'd like to increase, like judgments of liking, judgments of trust of the other group, and you show a really remarkable uh, reduction in anxiety about interacting with members of the other group. The result? A small but noticeable increase in social mixing between Muslim and white children. Professor Houston is clear that this active integration is the way ahead we see this kind of social intervention as an incredibly important way to build a bulwark against extremism. I'd go so far as to say that, that it's a beacon for um, the whole country. The principle shouldn't just apply to schools. Limits to the ethnic mix in social housing could promote integration. 
local authorities could publish annual measures of residential segregation so the most and least integrated part of the country can be identified. There are now three million Muslims in Britain, with half being born overseas. In Tooting, where Anis and Sajid Karim have their shop, the number of Muslims has risen in the last 10 years. The Karim brothers are the face of integration that most people want to see. But according to our survey, their approach to living as Muslims in Britain is under serious challenge. I've got lots of different uh, friends from different religions and I mix with all types of people, all faiths, all colours. Me, uh, Muslim, non-Muslims, uh, I uh, interact with everybody, play football once a week with uh, many non-Muslims. I do feel British, 100% British. It's the only country I've known, it's where I've lived. Britain faces a huge challenge. Adopting a policy of active integration may give rise to some ideas that make you, me, Muslims, non-Muslims, everyone feel pretty uncomfortable. But what is our choice? We could cross our fingers, close our eyes and hope that the segregation, the tensions, the periodic outrages and the backlash that follows will somehow simply vanish. Or we could seize the initiative take steps to support those Muslims who do want their communities to change in their attitudes towards women, towards lesbian and gay people, and indeed towards violence. I know which of those I would choose. A policy of active integration must be the first step on the path towards those shared values that will come to define what it means to be British for Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Next Wednesday, a beautiful place, Koh Tao, where dark things have happened to Westerners, mysterious deaths, conspiracy theories, and the inside story of murder in paradise at 10. But next tonight, in hostile waters, the island with Bear Grylls. <laughs>